I feel like a senior, very much. <laughs> so why improving resilience and efficiency? It has been said before, I can be brief, uh, we want resilient and efficient animals uh, because we think they are better at dealing uh, with the increasing frequency of environmental disturbances due to climate change. Yep, and we want to improve resilience and efficiency through breeding, which is one of the goals of Gentor. But when we started with Gentor, uh, we had some questions. How can we breed for more resilient and efficient animals? I am if these are very complex traits, depending on many factors. Well, how can we breed for resilience and efficiency if we don't have practical and scalable definitions? How can we breed for these if we don't have any models that can predict these traits already early in life? And how can we take into account the variation that can happen, for example, in efficiency throughout life? So these were some of the questions um, that we'd like to, well, at least shed a light on uh, within, within Gentor. And um, we chose to apply or use data to solve some of these questions. We know that many data are being collected. Um, these data can be on farm specifics or farm characteristics like herd size, but we also have um, uh, farm and animal performance data from the milf monthly milk recording system, but we also have increasingly often precision livestock farming technologies on farms, um, aka sensors that measures uh, milk yield, um, activity, rumination. And a characteristic of these PLF technologies is that they are cow individual, they're longitudinal, and they're high frequent. And it is this characteristic that we want to explore and exploit to solve some of the answers that I just mentioned. So at the start, we did not have a practical and scalable definition, particularly not for resilience. So we worked, um, we worked at several approaches to do so within Gentor. One of the approaches that we used was developed by Marike Popper and her colleagues. And um, she used the responses in milk yield to environmental disturbances and she used um, the assumption that resilience is the ability of an animal to be minimally affected by disturbances, and if they are affected, that they recover quickly. Now, she used milk yields that are provided by automatic milking systems, and she used these measurements, and she also used a predicted milk yield, and the difference between these two, that's what she used to develop um, resilience proxies. And she came up with two, the variance and the autocorrelation. And in the upper graph, you see an example of a cow that has low variance and a low autocorrelation. And we assume that this animal is a resilient one. On the bottom graph, you see a cow that has high variance and high autocorrelation values. And we think that this is a less resilient animal. Now, Marika also calculated the heritabilities of these uh, proxies. And they were both heritable, with variance having slightly higher heritabilities than the autocorrelation. And she linked it also to traits that we think or that we link to resilience, like fertility, production, or diseases. Um, both of these traits, these proxies, also had genetic correlations with these traits, although the variance showed higher genetic correlations than the autocorrelation. So this work, we thought, okay, the variance seems to be a very good um, proxy for resilience. Now, as I mentioned, Marika used daily milk yields from an automatic milking system, but not everybody as an automatic milking system. So we also explored a different way of defining resilience or a different proxy for resilience. And we came up with a lifetime resilience score, which is a cumulative result of the ability of a cow to recalf and pass on her genes to the next generation, taking into account aspects of production, fertility, and health. We wanted to use readily available data uh, on many, many farms. Um, and it's a score where we also compare an individual cow um, to her herd mates and peers. 
So that makes this lifetime resilience score also adapted or adopted to local circumstances. It's a very simple score. It has just a few, few areas um, and it applies bonus or malice points depending on an individual cow performing better or worse than her peers. Finally, a trait that has been used is uh, the longevity, where we, um, where the assumption is that um, longevity is the result of all the be positive benefits of resilience. And we have the true and functional longevity, where the true longevity is the ability of an animal to delay any culling or death. And the functional longevity is the ability of animals to avoid involuntary culling. So we had several methods, ways to define uh, resilience. Then we also wanted to predict resilience uh, using PLF or other data, but at least predicting early in life. And one of the things that we did is, well, I just talked about um, the longevity, the functional and true longevity. Um, and we uh, investigated or studied which traits measured in the first lactation were associated to culling and therefore associated with longevity. So a survival analysis was conducted with uh, French Holstein cows um, to compute the longevity and that was associated with traits measured in the first lactation. And we saw that insemination status, calving ease, conformation traits in particular in the other depth clinical mastitis, somatic cell count, and displaced abomasum were traits that had a major effect on culling and therefore a major effect on the two longevity traits. And the, this risk factors, these risk factors for culling can be seen as early predictors for the length of true and functional longevity. It's a way of predicting. Another way of predicting was to use precision livestock farming data and where we try to predict the ranking of resilience using these high frequent data. So we took resilience, in this case, the lifetime resilience score as independent variable, uh, sorry, dependent variable, and the PLF data collected through the first lactation as independent source. But then the challenge is, if we have this longitudinal data, how to summarize it into variables that say something, that can be used as predictive variables. And we took basically two approaches. The first one is a summarizing approach. So we took the data collected over one lactation and we summarized these into curve parameters, summary statistics. This has the benefit that it's a very generic approach that we can apply to many more PLF um, um, technologies. Um, and it also has the benefit that it perhaps does not require a lot of data quality and quantity. The downside is, is gee, gee, we're gonna summarize quite a long period and by summarizing it, we might ignore some of the disturbances. So the other approach was focusing really on those events yeah, where we see a deviation in a predicting milk yield. And we try to characterize these specific dynamics and use these variables as potentially predictive ones for a model. The benefit of that is then we really look into how cows react on environmental disturbances. The downside is, is that it put a lot more of requirements on data quality and quantity than the first method. We used, by the way, a logistic regression model and a machine learning model to predict resilience, the lifetime resilience score using data in the first lactation. A quick glance here, you, you will see that it doesn't, well, we can predict it. It doesn't really matter which method we are using. Um, but I would like to highlight that if we're gonna use the curve dynamics, so the specific details when it's milk yield is deviating from the predicted one, it seems to be better performing than the curve parameters, but there's a huge range between farms. So we were unable to develop a one-size-fits-all model. And the second, second thing I wanna briefly highlight, 
So when you, we use the machine learning approach, the data-driven approach, in this case a random forest, and we provided this random forest the same curve parameters as we provided the logistic regression model, it doesn't perform a lot better, which is, well, mm, yammer, sad, but hey, at least it's not worse. Um, but it was a little bit surprising that when we give that random forest just simple daily values, it also performs similarly. And to me that meant, oh wow, so we can just simply do daily values of sensor measurement and can have a predictive model rather than extensively uh, do a extensive data pre-processing which is needed for the logistic regression. And finally, uh, models and methodologies to account for the variation throughout production stages or lifetime. And we, here we specifically looked at the efficiency. Um, and when we talk about f efficiency within Gento, we basically talk about feed efficiency. And that's um, measured through the residual feed intake, which is simply put the difference between actual and predicted feed intake. Now, a common method to get to this residual feed intake is the use of um, linear regression. But by design, that method is incapable of taking the known variation into account because it assumes that the coefficients are constant through time, which they are not. We know that. So Gentor tried a new methodology and came up with the, with the dynamic residual feed intake. So we can measure residu residual feed intake um, at any time uh, through a multiple trait regression. And I don't know the ins and outs, but people in this room do know. But it's the difference between the animal effect of the actual trimetro intake and the animal effect of the predicted intake for different energy sources, like milk, wheel, uh, weight, and body condition score. How am I doing in time? I think it's, hmm. no, that's good. With what I showed you, um, the Gentor has some applications and impact. We know that we can use longitudinal PLF data uh, to quantify and predict cow-specific resilience. So a farmer can rank animals on his or her farm at any moment in time. And when we can predict it, also early in life, this can be a tool uh, for farmers to decide which cow which cows to keep and breed, and which cows to replace. And it established the best animal in environment herd. We also identified risk factors for culling, and identifying these risk factors can help farmers and their advisors to focus on the areas that they do not score very well, and try to improve that, and by doing so, improve resilience as well. And then finally, we have methodologies that can take into account the variation. Um, it also means that if you rank animals for efficiency using the residual feed intake, it will vary across time. It will not be constant. Um, and I did not say that in a previous slide, but Gento also looked at the best time period to quantify the feed efficiency, and that happened to be the steady state period, so for dairy cattle, the mid-lactation. It has been already briefly commented by um, the previous presenter that with all the work that we try to do with efficiency and feed efficiency, we do rely on actual feed intake, which is still a cost, uh, costly business to do so. And that will continue to be a limiting factor so far. And that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. We have time for Welcome. a few questions. Uh, if you're going to apply this for genomics, for ge selection, not for picking the best cow in the herd, but uh, most selection these days is done on genomics, and you're using as your sort of gold standard the, the lifetime efficiency of the, the animal. So 
why don't you just develop a good prediction genomic prediction equation for lifetime profitability or lifetime efficiency? I feel a new project <laughs> coming up here. <laughs> This could be an approach, I guess, yeah. If I can just add to that, the, sure. the correlations that Marika found between her resilience disturbances uh, and longevity were not one, were a long way off one. So that suggests that in addition to using some kind of lifetime measure, there may be additional benefit from using these uh, shorter term variabilities, which we get earlier in the life cycle as well. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Claudia. Just sort of following that up to some degree, I mean, how, how important do you think this is in terms of looking at um, the opportunities for predictions and tools at an individual farm level, where we're looking at that local, basic production environment? Because obviously, we've got genomics being massively important at population level and yep. in the long term, but for a farm that could go out of business with a high feed price, how could we use these tools that are out there for that farm level opportunity? Well, I think we try to do so, something similar within, uh, within Agento and we provided or we developed a software, a demonstration software tool where we used the lifetime resilience score basically as first concept to, uh, to help farmers and their advisors to focus on, on certain areas for their management. So yeah, good question. <laughs> Do you want to add something? Tomorrow. Good. Good job. <laughs> Time for another question, if anybody has one. Mizek. Mizek, you need the microphone for the live stream. Oh, so we can hear your voice broadcast across the nation. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> so a very quick question on uh, these indicators that you are getting on the farm. So one of the concentration there is on milk yield from robotic milking. Yeah. But we know that the robot also gives us quite a lot of other parameters, yeah. Yeah. temperature and all those kind of things. Have you also attempted to use the other indicators no. as well? No, but I agree with you fully that we underutilized the information that can be provided by an automatic milking system. I completely agree with you. Thank you. Perhaps in addition to that question, have you also considered asking the farmer uh, which of his cows would be the most resilient or durable cows? Because I think, I think in, in, uh, in New Zealand, the, the, that is one of the, or by far the best indicator to predict the durability of, uh, of their cows when the farmer just says from his heifers, this one will be the best, this one will be the most dur durable. Hmm. Perhaps it works the same with resilience. Would that be a Well, I know that um, Jonathan has also been involved in, uh, in a number of stakeholder meetings and asked that question. So maybe, Jonathan, you can reply on that one. Thank you, Claudia. I think, I think what's been surprising is when we, um, we looked at some of these data sets in terms of five-year data sets, and we, um, we actually looked at stakeholders and we saw which cows did survive, it wasn't always the ones they predicted. And actually, it was a lower predictive value. So actually, the sense of data and those outcomes did beat the kind of farmer perception more than in those stakeholder meetings. We surprised quite a lot of the farmers. Just picking Ms. X point up slightly as well, we did do some work looking at accelerometer data as well from those, and it did improve the prediction in some of the some of the work too. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions in the chat? Nope. Is there anybody actually watching this outside? <laughs> 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 Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you. <laughs>